So this is an image that, uh, at some level, I want to contrast to that previous talk. Many of us perhaps had a vision of utopia of the internet at some point. Um, and this kind of reminds me of that. I certainly wasn't the first person to think that the internet would be a, a, a kind of opportunity to create a positive utopia. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the positive and uh, utopias that we might hope for and some of the different uh, dystopian things that actually happen. So as I said, I wasn't the first. This is an image, uh, a fresco by Raphael, 1511, and it's displaying the school of Athens. It's full of philosophers, scientists, and mathematicians discussing, sharing ideas, and uh, you know, it's kind of beautiful. But uh, there's a couple of odd things uh, about this. And actually, before I talk about the odd things about it, the, the, the link to the internet here is, is interesting, right? These people didn't actually live in the same place at the same time. So, you know, the, the internet, in some sense, creates this school of Athens, right? People don't have to be in the same place at the same time in order to start sharing information and discussing and, you know, learning more about the world. I can be in New York and you can have written a blog and be sleeping in Mali and I can write my reply. We don't have to be in the same place at the same time. Um, so that's one interesting thing about this image. The other one is that, um, you know, they seem really agreeable with each other by and large. And, uh, you know, my experience of people sharing different ideas, especially on contentious and philosophy and politics, is that the discussion isn't always so friendly, especially online. So you might think that, you know, actually maybe this is a totally ridiculous image of conversation on the internet. Uh, and you might laugh at me for showing it in that light, because perhaps your vision of the internet looks a little bit more like this. You know, this is maybe conversation on the internet as, you know, pictorified. But actually, it's, it's actually much darker than that, unfortunately. Um, maybe it's this. Uh, the unfortunate reality is that people are harassed into suicide. Journalists are threatened into silence. And, you know, if you disagree, you can be shouted out of a conversation, and in some countries, arrested and put in prison. So the kind of negative side of this is that the dark, this is a dark side of the internet. You can either be kind of forced into filter bubbles, or at the points you actually disagree and discuss, you can be harassed out of a conversation. So in terms of harassment, this is a report from the Pew Research Center of US internet users. And the numbers here are quite shocking. They were to me, about a quarter of women are stalked, sexually harassed, and physically threatened online. This is the more recent report in 2017, which highlights some of the impact of this. You know, from witnessing the harassment of others, 27% of people said that they are refraining from posting something online. 13% said they would stop using a platform. That means it's having a very significant silencing effect. And actually, if we look at the trend over the last few years, a lot of news organizations are turning off the comments altogether. These are organizations whose somehow reason to exist is to support public discussion and debate on an issue, and they're shutting down one of the fundamental platforms for doing that. So um, this seems terrible. So we have to ask the flip question, which is, yeah, OK, what could we do about this? Um, so that maybe the positive side of the question is, what does it mean to have a good discussion? But this isn't very easy either, right? Like, what, what does it mean to have a good discussion? And in fact, there's this concept of a wicked problem, which is one that's you know, really, really perhaps impossible to solve, because even if you try to describe what the problem is, it sounds incomplete, contradictory. You know, if I'm trying to express myself freely, but then people are refraining from posting because they're scared of the response of other people's free expression, it seems inherently contradictory. So, you know, and then the, the internet and the conversation forums that we have are themselves changing. So maybe we could flip that around and say, well, okay, so we don't really know necessarily right away what it is to be good. We'll, we'll get further there shortly, but we could look at well, what are actual concrete risks, take a more kind of security threat model to it. And, you know, well, there's very clearly reputational risks. Someone can post a video about you or your organization uh, kind of making wild claims about what you are. It can be, we've just seen in the previous talk the kind of uh, ISIS propaganda. If you try to like, actually have a discussion or create a public space for comment, then you can end up being shouted out of that conversation or harassed into silence. So bad conversations, this is a clearly an area of the threat. 
There can be a much more insidious version of this, though, that actually if you're trying to discuss something even inside your company, bad discussions can exacerbate toxic culture and misunderstandings. And then it can impact decision making, too. Um, one example that we had is we had, we invited a, a group of women who had been the target of organized online harassment uh, to come and talk to us. And the people who had been harassing them then decided to ha harass us because by association we were somehow, you know, by talking to them they considered that to be bad. So the result was like my manager had letters written to him and his manager saying that they should fire me, and explaining in some length about why I should be fired. And I watched this unfolding on 4chan and Reddit forums and could see some of the tactics they're playing. And, and as, a, as a white guy, I didn't actually get very much harassment. The sad reality is that uh, women and people of color get a lot more harassment. What, what, what could we do about it? What, so the problem isn't new, right? People having good conversations is extremely difficult, has always been so at some level. Uh, but there is something that is new and very interesting, which is, uh, some advances in machine learning that I want to talk about a little bit. So first of all, machine learning is machine's ability to spot patterns in data. That's roughly what it means. So we could take an example. If I show a machine millions of images and I tell it which ones are images of cats, slowly the machine can start to understand the patterns in the pixels that are correlated with the images of cats. The machine can start to recognize cats. Um, so What's deep learning then? Deep learning is the ability for machines, it's a recent advances, it refers to the recent advances and the ability of machines to recognize much more complex patterns. So when you can recognize much more complex patterns, you can then do much more. So we might be able to, for example, start to understand something about the emotional characteristics of language. Um, so, you know, we have to then ask the question, okay, so now we know a little bit what our machine learning is, how might we use it to help conversations, and how might it actually be damaging as well? So the interesting aspects of this is that we have to, if we want to do this, the key challenge for deep learning, for this ability to recognize much more sophisticated patterns in language, is you have to have lots of data. You have to have lots of examples of what it is you're looking for. So we can start to imagine what would this be like, right? So we could say, well, maybe the machine would be able to give me advice. I'm writing a message, and you know, maybe you say, you know, the, the tone you've written there is something that sounds kind of passive aggressive. Maybe it says, oh, well, this bit here, you're taking something very lightly that's quite serious. You might want to reconsider that. Um, then maybe that would help me as an author write. On the other side, like if I'm trying to curate a discussion, if I'm trying to have a really good discussion on a contentious topic, maybe it can help me organize and connect the comments and make the discussion better at some level. Uh, and maybe it can help understand some of these emotional aspects. And you know, at this point, you might go, Lucas, you're crazy, right? We've, we've, we've seen Star Trek and even science fiction's fantasies about what a machine can do, what data, right, the most amazing android can do. He doesn't understand emotions. To imagine that machines can understand emotions, perhaps that's ridiculous. So I want to, um, first of all, present a little counter argument to that, which is something that gives us maybe some hope that we can do something interesting here. And then we'll look at some actual data and examples as well. So the counter argument is like, let's look at the way actually human learning works, and let's look at the way evolution works at some level. You know, animals and babies have some element of emotional understanding before they develop the ability to solve logic puzzles. <coughs> Why is it that we think machines would be so different? And at some level, we think the machines would be different because of the tradition of programming. In programming, you specify exactly what the machine's going to do. It's very logical. It's very structured. But in machine learning, it's totally different. You show examples, and you ask the machine to find the patterns. And what that does often is find things that surprise you. So, uh, so that's an interesting thing to bear in mind. What if science fiction has it all backwards? Robots are going to be emotional before they're going to be smart. So, I mean, it's a fun thought. Hold it for a while and uh, see what you think. And what we'll look at next. Um, is some of the things we might do. So let's talk now about what it takes to actually build machines that can help us, perhaps, with conversations. So the first challenge, uh, what are we looking for? So we're going to train a machine, but we have to show it examples of something. Are we going to show it examples of things that are off-topic? Are we going to show it examples of things that are unsubstantial? Is it going to be something about offense? What do we want to show it? So, you know, there's a giant space of questions there. The first one we're going to take for sake of argument, and because we've done a bunch of research on it, is this idea that there's some comments that people have such an emotional reaction to, they no longer want to be in the discussion at all. 
If people are not in discussion, you cannot have a good conversation. So it's quite a natural starting point. And we call that um, toxicity. OK, so the next problem then, um, yeah, people don't really agree, right? We, people don't agree on what is going to make people leave a discussion. For one person, it might be one thing. For someone else, it might be something else. Um, and that, that is a challenge. So, but it turns out that for machine learning, you don't need to have golden truths. You don't need to have the answer. What you can do is instead model people's reactions. There's, there's, it turns out that there's actually many things that people very largely agree are not helping a discussion. And there's lots of things people think, yeah, that's fine. And there is a gray area. So then all you have to do is think, well, OK, maybe the machine will just say, when it's a gray area, it will try and say, I, I don't know. And so the machine will be imperfect. It will be, sometimes it doesn't know, but maybe it can still be useful. So on to the next thing, so an offensive comment, perhaps. Uh, or is it? You know, that is a pretty fat pig. Um, context matters. A comment in one context can be interpreted totally different than in a different context. So you know, for this thing to be perfect, we have to give it the context as well. That makes the machine learning problem much harder. Um, but it turns out that actually many things you don't need that much context for. And sometimes you know, you're know you going to get it wrong. So what we've got now then is machines that are definitely very imperfect. Uh, and we can try to work on getting them being more context aware. And we'll make some progress there. But it's not that easy. So then the next problem. We need lots of data. We need lots of examples. And where are we going to get them? So you know, I think, well, OK, you know, toxic stuff, the internet's full of it. But actually, it turns out that the perception of toxicity um, is quite sensitive. The, most websites and most comment forums, it's like one in 100 or one in 1,000 comments that are really toxic. But because you read quite a lot of them, you can quite easily get the impression that it's awful. And that means a big problem, because if we only have one in 1,000 examples that are, or one in 100 examples that are toxic, how do we get the labels for which ones are toxic? We have to look at 1,000 examples to find one. That's very bad for big data. So the kind of general solution that people take in this space is crowdsourcing. You basically have to put lots of work into it. Or you have to like, select particular forums where you believe there's more of them. And then you have to like, look at all of the comments that are there. OK, so you know, we can imagine now we might be able to get some slightly larger collection of examples of things that are toxic. Now there's another problem. You know, When you're training a machine learning algorithm, at some level, you're trying to create a bias. You're trying to create a bias, in this case, for comments being toxic. But those aren't the only biases that happen. If all of your examples of certain kinds of comments you know, are toxic, and, and, uh, and here's, a, here's a real example, it turns out that a very large fraction of the comments that contain the word gay on the internet are insults. Now, if you don't have enough examples of positive comments about, with the word gay in them, it's very hard for the machine to learn to distinguish the positive from the negative uses. And so if you do this thing without thinking about unintended bias, you will end up with lots of challenges. And it is really difficult. And even when you start to correct for it, it's still difficult. So what do we get then? OK, so we can, we've got various methods to correct for it. We can find examples which are good and try and balance it. We can guess what the terms are. Um, and so, so now we've built this very imperfect machine learning thing. And we can ask, well, how is it that it can actually support conversation? So I think we'll look at a few examples. Um, and this is where. Let's see if we can do. Actually, I'm, I'll, I've got a, a full a link, but uh, given we've got the last couple of minutes. Um, these is random comments. There's 11,000 comments a day on the 4th of September uh, to, on Wikipedia. Uh, the previous slide was just showing you where the comments are. Now, if you are sensitive to uh, offensive comments, now is the time to start averting your eyes, because I'm, next I'm going to show you it scored by a machine learning model, which is going to have the more toxic and horrible ones at the top of the list. Um, so that's, if you're looking through this, you're looking for about you know, 10 or 100 horrible comments. If you sort it differently, this is the top few comments. Uh, very different in character. So this suggests, OK, maybe there's something interesting that's happening there. So uh, working with the New York Times, then we built an open source tool to help them do moderation. This is what it looks like. You select you know, some machine learning model, and then you get shown a histogram of comments. You can select which range of comments you want to look at. And you can say, OK, I want to look at these ones, moderate them first. You can say, quickly scan through them. It will show you the bold bit that's most problematic. And then you can like, decide to accept it or reject it um, based on your review of the comments. So the interesting thing about this is this has actually enabled the New York Times to increase the number of comments that they have on their newspaper. So that's, a, that's the, perhaps a, a little bit of optimism, that perhaps we can build tools that help curate conversation. Um, this is, that was helping someone who is um, trying to curate a good conversation. Maybe that we can help authors. So this is a demo we have. It gets lots of things wrong, but it's quite fun. Uh, and it's actually quite fun to get things wrong, uh, to find the examples where it gets wrong. 
Uh, and that actually helps us, so please go ahead and do that. So, and, and the really interesting thing about this is actually research from Riot Games. Riot Games found that actually by giving feedback to people, um, they were able to make significant changes to the amount of toxicity in their games. Uh, and then, of course, the other thing we can do is help us ourselves understand toxic contributions. On the left-hand side is a nice visualization by our delightful hosts at Wired on you know, the time of day and the toxicity of comments. Darkness is toxicity, number of comments is the length of that line, and that's the clock there. On the right-hand side is some research we did trying to understand, you know, is it really about anonymous accounts? Is it really about a small number of trolls who are writing all the toxic contributions? And unfortunately, uh, it's not. It's a lot of people are writing a lot of horrible comments. So this is also kind of the result of Riot Games' research, that there's this hypothesis that's forming now that uh, toxicity on the internet is, um, has a huge contribution from people just having a bad day. So at this point, uh, I'll leave you with a summary uh, and say thank you very much for listening. Thank you.